Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your patience. I think we're ready to get started. My name is Mike Sfrega. I'm the director of the Polar Institute. I also direct the Global Risk and Resilience Program here, and I want to thank you all for coming to the Wilson Center this afternoon for what I think is a very important presentation. I want to thank all of you here in the audience, the many, many we have online uh, watching, and a particular welcome to our colleagues in Alaska, and let me tell you why. As with other events here, we're recording today's program, and it will be rebroadcast through GCI, which is Alaska's telecommunications network, to all homes and organizations that they serve. So my appreciation to GCI for their continued support of the Polar Institute and for bringing to Alaskans these types of discussions. And the reason that's important is because, as we all know, it's Alaska that makes the United States an Arctic nation. And we thought it very important to bring these dialogues to the state of Alaska. We do that through live streaming, but of course, many villages in our state don't have access to high-speed internet. So through GCI, we're able to rebroadcast these programs to every home and organization they serve. So we very much support GCI's effort in that place and in that very special place. Today's program, Iceland and the Arctic, Icelandic Chairmanship of the Arctic Council, and I will say here, we'll put an addendum to it and other related issues. Iceland assumed the chairmanship of the Arctic Council from Finland on May 7, 2019 in Rovaniemi. Iceland will serve as the chair of the Arctic Council through 2021. Last evening, and again this morning at the Icelandic Embassy, we celebrated this transition and explored various themes related to the Arctic Council's agenda, crafted by Iceland's leadership and agreed upon by all eight Arctic nations. Foreign Minister Thurisson, I want to thank you very much for allowing the Wilson Center to be a part of your celebration and your leadership. Mr. Ambassador, the same as well. Iceland has been a good friend of the United States, certainly of the Wilson Center, and we're honored to play some small role in helping you advance this important agenda. I also want to thank our colleagues at the Harvard Kennedy School Belfort Center's Arctic Initiative. They've become a very good colleagues, and we see a network growing between Harvard and the Woodrow Wilson Center to address the very important issues related to the Arctic. So to today's program. It will begin with a presentation by the Foreign Minister and explore Iceland's Arctic Council agenda, as I said, perhaps other related issues. And we'll get Iceland's unique interests in the Arctic out on the table. We'll explore those interests and how they relate to the other Arctic nations and, in fact, all the global community. We'll then transition to a discussion here on the stage with me, but most importantly, we will engage with you, the audience. So Minister Thordeson has served as Minister for Foreign Affairs of Iceland since January 2017. He's been a member of the Parliament since 2003 and served as Minister of Health from 2007 to 2009. And as Minister of Foreign Affairs, he is responsible for Iceland's foreign policy, also as it relates to external trade, international development cooperations, security, and defense. And the Foreign Minister's distinguished uh, background has been uh, handed out to all of you. So please welcome to the podium Foreign Minister Thordeson. Sir, the floor is yours. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to be with you here today in the beautiful city of Washington at this distinguished institution and to get the opportunity to share with you our vision for the future of the Arctic region, as well as some insights into Iceland priorities during our two-year chairmanship of the Arctic Council. But I want to begin by mentioning your important work here at the Wilson Center. The Center's approach on its subject matters, offering high-quality views on issues of real inter international importance, has seldom been as relevant as in today's increasingly complex world. We need interdisciplinary approaches to be able to fully understand the challenges we face and to seize the opportunities that rapid changes in our region bring about. And we are fortunate that Mr. Srakra is both the head of the Wilson Center Global Risk and Resilience Program and the director of the Center's Polar Institute, because I know that sustainable development is at the heart of the work of both GRRP and the Polar Institute. This is important, truly, 
because sustainable development may in fact be the single most important element to reduce tensions and alleviate risk or escalation in the Arctic region. I will come back to that later. Iceland assumes the role of, of chair of the Arctic Council just two weeks ago from our Finnish partners, who successfully concluded the term at a minister meeting in Rovaniemi in Finland. Iceland is taking over the chairmanship at a crucial time for the Arctic regions, with the prospect of new oceans and coastlines opening up. Key global actors are focusing their attention to the regions. We see this both in international and regional politics, in academia and business. And this has indeed created a new real reality for all of us. But while the interest at stake are high, we must all maintain a cool head and keep our feet firmly on the ground. First, let's look at some facts. Temperatures in the Arctic are rising at more than twice the average global rate and Arctic warming trends are expected to continue towards the mid-century. According to scientists, trends after 2050 will depend on today's mitigating actions. In Iceland, we feel and see the effects of this with changes in the migration and availability of fish stocks in our waters and with retreating glaciers around the country. <laughs> Moreover, we know that melting sea ice and ocean acidification put the entire marine ecosystems at risk. Adaption to these changes will be challenging, not only for most communities in the north, but globally, making regional and international cooperation vital. And we need deliberate responses, responses guided by the fundamental principle of sustainable development and decision based on scientific research and knowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, before I delve into the Arctic Council Chairmanship Program, I would like to offer some reflection and an Icelandic perspective on the changed geostrategic situation and challenges facing us in the high north. First, all actors in the Arctic are dependent on close and peaceful cooperation that stretches across borders and boundaries. Beyond the national jurisdiction of the Arctic Council member state, the Arctic region is, in fact, governed in a cooperative manner, primarily through the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Peaceful cooperation in the Arctic should continue to be at the forefront as we better realize the ever-growing opportunities that lie in the region. But we also need to be aware of the threats and challenges that face us in the Arctic and the effects they could have both locally and globally. Geography presents us with strategic facts. Iceland is located centrally in the North Atlantic with Greenland to the west and the Faroe Islands, the UK and Norway to the east. The Arctic Circle touches Iceland's northern tip and straight lines can be drawn through the Atlantic respectively to the North and South Poles. This geostrategic location has largely determined Iceland's security policy since the mid-20th century. It was then, with the development of naval technology, particularly submarines and later aviation, including long-range aircraft, that Iceland became a strategic hub and, a tra and the transatlantic link was born. During the Cold War, Secure communication between North America and Europe became fundamental to the credibility and viability of NATO. In 2006, the US forces withdrew from Iceland and virtually on the same day, Russia chose to resume its strategic bumper flights into the Icelandic airspace. In recent years, this has called for enhanced foreign presence in Europe exercises and capability developments with increased defense budget, sea lines of communications and strategic air corridors across the Atlantic are also getting more attention within the alliance. 
Most recently, this also extends to securing, securing underwater cables, which provide essential el electronic communication. Ladies and gentlemen, how does this affect Iceland? As the only founding member of NATO without armed national forces, Iceland relies on Article 5 and a bilateral defense agreement with the US. Nonetheless, we contribute in many different ways to our national and common defense within the alliance, through civilian capabilities, personal and experience, and have our own perspective on security developments in our region in a broad sense. This is reflected in our national security policy, which enjoys cross-party support and sets the framework for the security and defense policy of our broadly based coalition government. <laughs> Successive Icelandic governments have expressed their hope that the Arctic would not be militarized beyond the levels seen following the end of the Cold War. A position that is manifested in our Arctic policy from 2011 which was also adopted through a consensus across the political spectrum. As others, we recognize Russia's right to safeguard their legitimate security interest in the region with credible defense capabilities. However, the scope, speed and apparent ambitions of the Russian military built up in the Arctic does raise questions. In our view, military built up in the high north needs to be avoided. This point cannot be overstated. Reaching common understandings and solutions while respecting international laws that govern the region and maintaining the stability that has so far characterized the region is of interest and benefit to us all. Increased attention and activities on non-Arctic states in the region have also drawn attention. Asian states have shown keen interest in the work of the Arctic Council, with China, India, Japan, South Korea and Singapore all joining the observers group of the Arctic Council in 2013. This increased interest is moreover reflected in policy making in states such as China and in organizations such as the European Union, mirroring a substantial change in international priorities from what they were just 15 years ago. A warming climate and the resulting opening up of the sea routes, easier access to natural resources and possible security threats resulting from increased traffic in the area, area pose new challenges and make it increasingly important to ensure that the Arctic remains a low tension area. This is best done through multilateral coll collaboration and dialogue. It is not least for this reason that the Arctic Council will have an increasingly important role to play in years and decades to come. This new reality facing us in the Arctic is reflected in the Arctic Council's developing international role as the central forum for cooperation in the region. While the Arctic Council does not address military security, the conflictual elements that may result from the opening up of the Arctic make the Council's contribution to sustainable development in the region increasingly relevant. The Arctic Council is an important venue for dialogue and peaceful cooperation in the Arctic region. It is cl its clear mandate and regional focus on sustainable development and novelist building has allowed it to continue its work, irrespective of global political tensions. This is not least because of the emphasis is put on the quality of the work of the Council and its subsidiary bodies. In this respect, I truly believe that an active dialogue based on best available scientific research and knowledge conducted through dynamic collaboration between our countries and organization is the best way forward for a constructive development of the Arctic Council. Iceland will continue to emphasize this during our chairmanship in the Arctic Council, and we welcome the U.S. increased interest in the region. Ladies and gentlemen, the Arctic Council focus on sustain sustainable development and the scientific and policy work that has been carried out by its subsidiary bodies has yielded important discussions and results on a variety of issues. The Arctic Council has, for instance, increased and broadened our understanding 
of the Arctic ecosystem and then enable us to make informed de decisions on how we approach the region, environment and resources. This has also proven relevant to states outside the Arctic, which may explain growing interest in obtaining observer status in recent years. The Arctic Council is running numerous ambitious projects, which will continue during our chairmanship. In our priorities, we will highlight certain aspects of the Council's already ambitious agenda, as well as introducing new field of cooperation through specific projects. As I alluded to earlier, sustainable development will be the guiding light in our chairmanship program and our heading together towards a sustainable Arctic emphasizes the need for harmonized international efforts. Moreover, we highlight the need for a holistic approach to sustainable development, addressing equally each of its three pillars, the environment, the economy, as well as the social aspects. In our chairmanship program, we have highlighted four main priority areas. First, and not entirely surprisingly, the Arctic marine environment. The oceans will figure at the heart of our program. The largest part of the Arctic region is covered by oceans, and the welfare of a large part of the population in the Arctic is based on the sustainable utilization of marine resources. The Arctic Council subsidiary bodies have carried out many important ocean-related projects, and Iceland will focus on further development of projects in that field. Iceland is particularly interested in strengthening Arctic Council cooperation on mitigating plastic pollution of the ocean and is planning an international scientific conference on the topic in Reykjavik, Iceland in April 2020. <laughs> Iceland also wants to introduce a new project focusing on innovation and efficient utilization of marine biological resources or so-called blue bioeconomy. Experience has shown that through innovation and biotechnological solutions, it is possible to increase significantly the utilization level of biomass taken out of the oceans. Through successful application of the method, it provides for a positive outcomes for the environment, it strengthens the economy and has positive effect in the communities. Our second priority concerns climate and green energy solutions. We will maintain an emphasis on meteorological cooperation. In that respect, I would like to mention explicitly a project on mapping glaciers and providing more accurate information on the dramatic glacial reduction being witnessed in our part of the world. The impending shift in energy sources from fossil fuel to renewable energy will be important both for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and for improving air quality in Arctic communities. The only answer is to cut emissions immediately, and I want to commend the US on their demonstrated achievements in reducing black carbon emissions. It is a challenge to provide green solutions for energy production in remote communities in the Arctic, but this should be a high priority. Iceland will emphasize continuing to seek practical green energy solutions, focusing specifically on small communities in the Arctic. The Arctic has historically been bountiful in re renewable energy. In Iceland, we speak from first-hand experience as we have been fortunate enough to be able to harvest geothermal and hydropower for decades. There are mainly three viable alternatives in the Arctic. Firstly, hydropower, which constitutes over 70% of Iceland's stationary resources. Second, geothermal power, found in various parts of the Arctic, and which provides for all space heating in Iceland. And finally, wind power. Moreover, there's a huge potential in cutting emissions by using renewable energy on ships. Technolog technology related to alternative fuels for ship is already being developed in Iceland, and Icelandic fishing and shipping companies are making progressive changes in their operations. Our third main priority will be to support Arctic societies in building prosperous and sustainable communities. 
a more accessible Arctic will stimulate economic activities, both with regards to marine transport and tourism. Growing marine traffic in the Arctic will require better infrastructure to ensure acceptable safety standards. The polar code for Arctic shipping is in place, but safety in navigation is hampered in many areas due to the lack of reliable charts and other aids. Lack of telecommunications is also of great concerns for large areas in the Arctic. Improvements in telecommunications improve both safety at sea including search and rescue activities, and living conditions in the Arctic communities that have very limited telecommunication services. Most communi communities in the Arctic will face difficult choices when adapting to the environmental changes, not least small communities and the indigenous people. The Arctic Council has already undertaken some expert work on possible changes that might call for adaptation measures and we will continue to continue cooperation on matters like gender equality, connectivity and adaptation and resilience. Such analysis is highly valuable for policy makers and the Council will do even more to collect best practices that communities could benefit from. Last but not least, Iceland will continue to work for a stronger Arctic Council giving due attention for, to its inner working, workings and maintaining close consultation between member states and the permanent participants as well as continue to use innovative ways to enhance engagement with the Arctic Council observers. We will also focus on forming new partnerships. The Arctic Economic Council will celebrate its five years anniversary during Iceland's chairmanship and we plan to seize the opportunity to enhance the co collaboration between the two councils. Moreover, we aim at making the most of the fact that Iceland will also be chairing the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, an extremely important actor when debating security, search and rescue in an increasingly open and busy Arctic waters. Ladies and gentlemen, Looking ahead, trying to investigate what the future could hold in store for us, we know that scientific research indicates that we can expect more drastic changes to the Arctic environment in the next two decades than in the past hundred years. Even a fully implemented Paris Agreement is not expected to curb global warming until after the middle of the 21st century. Arctic ice will therefore continue to melt and ice-free marine areas will grow during the summer months. In order to ensure continued stability in the Arctic, a race for resources must be avoided. Not only because of the obvious mutual benefits of a sustainable use of natural resources, affecting both future economic interest and social development in the region, but also because it could threaten stability and peace in the Arctic and the North Atlantic. It continues to be a paramount that international law and norms prevail. All those present in the region, Arctic states as well as others, should be held to a high standard and provocation avoided. Maintaining a healthy, sustainable and prosperous Arctic region is of vital international importance. The potential is great, but so are the challenges. Developments in the Arctic regions offer us, the Arctic states, an opportunity to demonstrate how responsible global actors can and should interact. Following international principles and norms enshrined in international treaties, laws and agreements. If we are fortunate enough to keep the Arctic cool, and I am an optimist and I know that we are, we will remain for decades and centuries to come, truly on top of the world. Thank you. Minister, thank you for the wide-ranging comments, uh, everything from national and international security to the to the Arctic Council. It's appreciated. It's also appreciated that you ended on a positive note uh, at the top of the world, uh, keeping things more or less stable. Uh, 
We're going to engage the audience quite a bit here, but let me, let me just start with a, a couple of questions just to, to get us moving. So you mentioned uh, Secretary of State Pompeo. Uh, we can talk about the Rovaniemi meeting in a moment, but perhaps you can give us your take on his visit to Iceland and what that meant in terms of U.S.-Iceland relations, but also what it meant for, in particular, the Arctic and, and perhaps uh, our joint security concerns in that region. Well, in short, this is for the first time in the 11 years we have had Secretary of State, the U.S. Secretary of State in Iceland. Now, it's been a long time coming. And uh, the U.S. is, of course, one of our closest allies been for a very long time. So we were pleased to see uh, both uh, uh, Secretary Pompeo coming and also his message, which was very clear that uh, they are not going to forget uh, their friends and uh, we are friends and allies. And at the same time, it's obvious that uh, uh, the administration is uh, with the Arctic on their agenda, which is important. And uh, I was thinking about it just a few uh, weeks ago that I have had uh, 150 bilateral meetings in this two years as a, a, as a foreign minister. And uh, for the first one and a half year, from, because I always bring up the Arctic, Season. It's so important. And uh, there were very few who were uh, interested to have uh, policy or, or emphasize on the was first was the Asian countries, especially China and, and Russia. But both the, uh, both the uh, uh, Europeans, uh, both the Europeans and, and in North America, their, uh, their interest was not, uh, not as clear. But that has changed and that's, that's extremely good news. So this would be a good time to, to think about your, your questions. Uh, l let me follow up then with um, Iceland's role with NATO as well. The Trident Junction exercise certainly got the world's attention, certainly got our Russian colleagues' attention. From your perspective, uh, did, the, did the exercise do what it was intended to do? Mm -hmm. uh, deterrence versus uh, deterrence and a reflection of the Arctic becoming part of the globalized uh, efforts in, in security, part of the bigger geostrategic uh, issues that you have to deal with all the time. Mm -hmm. How did that come across for you and then also for, for Iceland? Well, I think what it did, uh, uh, what I found interesting is that when I spoke to the ones who were participating, uh, that uh, those folks hadn't been there for quite a long time. Mm. And uh, they have been in, in many other parts of the world, but uh, this is a special uh, surrounding uh, uh, which you need to be prepared for uh, everything that could happen. And uh, so we found it extremely important that we will have these uh, uh, exercises. They have been now two uh, in a very short period of time. And unfortunately, we need to be prepared for, uh, uh, for you could say, everything. But uh, even though uh, the best thing to avoid that we will have, uh, well, uh, NATO has always uh, been fortunate enough to give a very clear signal that we stick together, the allies, and uh, all of them. It makes no difference where they, they are. And for me, this was... Uh, uh, important message we gave and uh, a successful exercise. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask one more question, and I know that this will hopefully tease out some other questions. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't escape a discussion about the Arctic anymore without talking about China mm -hmm. and their significant investments and their interests in mm -hmm. the North. Mm -hmm. uh, we all have taken note of their interests around the globe. Mm -hmm. But your perspective, since they have invested in, in Iceland, your perspective on Chinese investment in the Arctic? Yeah, I, I think though, to be uh, fair, it's more talked about than actually practiced. And when it comes to the investment in, in Iceland, this has not been, not, not been much. We were the first one to uh, make all the uh, Western nations to make a free trade deal with them. Uh, but it, it's still that, uh, for example, the US is so far most important trading country. And when it comes to investment, foreign investment, uh, the uh, last five years, then 35% of this is from the US. So uh, I think it's important that uh, we uh, have, a, and as we have had, we have constructive, constructive uh, 
uh, cooperation uh, with with the Chinese, and of course it's good that we will see uh, uh, more uh, transaction when it comes to uh, uh, trading and and so on. But of course we are also aware of uh, that it's very important when we are keeping up the multilateral organizations of cooperation, and it will be based on the values it was mm. originally uh, based on and has been based on and should be based on. So uh, I think that uh, we know about the security uh, discussion and, and, and concerns, totally aware of that and working with other uh, countries in, uh, in, in NATO <coughs> when it comes to dealing with these issues and we'll keep on doing that. But uh, uh, Iceland cannot uh, complain about the cooperation with China. It's, it's been uh, constructive and good, and they are, but it's not that I sometimes hear uh, get this question if they're mm -hmm. just more all, all over and, and bottomless everything. It's very far from it, very, very far from it. And uh, their investment has been relatively small so far. There's been some uh, discussions about uh, Chinese facilities like the research facility and the ability to perhaps do dual use, whether it's civilian or non-civilian. Any concerns come up in, in Iceland about facilities that they have built, want to build? Well, it's just a one small research center in the north part of, of the country, but it's open for, for others also. Uh, they were interested, one uh, Chinese businessman was interested in buying a, a chunk of land a few years back mm -hmm. on the size of Malta, but uh, you need a special license for that and it was not granted. So uh, it's not, we got uh, 90,000 Chinese tourists per year to, to Iceland. Uh, we have 700,000 from the US. Uh, when it comes to uh, the most important trading countries, they are uh, number seven, similar size as, as Sweden. So, uh, but of course we know about their, their interest and, and uh, we know about their interest in, in the Arctic and mm -hmm. as the other parts of the world. And uh, I think that, uh, but it's as well, if everyone is just playing by the same rules based on the same values, then we don't <coughs> need to worry, but we need to be aware and see to it that will happen. Thank you. I'm going to ask, I lied, I'm going to ask one more question, <laughs> and then I will open it up to the audience. Uh, and, that, and that has to do with uh, at least beginning the start of the discussion about uh, Arctic Council leadership, although we can go back and forth a, as needed. Mm. Uh, the focus on sort of the maritime environment, the, the blue ocean economies, mm -hmm. uh, certainly not, not a surprise. Mm. Uh, but what has been interesting is that other nations have been talking about, it's become a catchphrase, the blue ocean economy. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about uh, you talked about the fisheries and other resources, but how do others grasp the blue ocean economy and how might Iceland be able to lead a more global discussion about the blue ocean economy? Yes, for the Arctic, mm -hmm. but maybe elsewhere as well. Yes, definitely. I, I think that, I mean, uh, sometimes we have done things uh, quite well. And fortunately, when it comes to uh, the blue economy in Iceland, then uh, we have, uh, which is extremely important. It wasn't always like that, mm. but we have a consensus among po uh, political party lines that we are basing all our fishing on, on scientific uh, research and, uh, uh, and, and there's no debate on that. So it's not, it, I, I remember when I was a kid, there was a debate that <laughs> they wanted to fish more than the scientists told us to do and so on. And mm. sometimes we did, and the, uh, every time it, it went horribly wrong. And uh, at the same time that we are the only uh, nation in the OECD who get net taxes mm -hmm. from fishing. Uh, and at the same time, it's sustainable. And uh, I think this is a story that we can tell and uh, share. And we get a lot of visitors from other countries. For example, now when the UK is, is leaving the EU, EU and they want to, uh, and they're going to take over their own, own, uh, own fishing uh, and uh, uh, sector, you could say, that they are looking into that and many other, other uh, countries in the world. And I think the most important, what has happened and uh, during the long course, that we are using, you just speak plainly, we're using the whole fish. We're not yeah. throwing away, you know, 30% or 40% or whatever. And some fishing uh, companies are using 100% and they use it for all kinds of pharmaceuticals, they use it for uh, healing uh, skin, working with the US military, uh, our company here in, in uh, which is ba uh, very active in, in the US, which we are very proud of, and uh, many others. So, 
I think it's about, I mean, we are very small nations, but sometimes when we do something that uh, obviously working and we can be proud of, then we can share that knowledge. So I think uh, uh, that is something that we should do, as you mentioned, not only when it comes to uh, the uh, Arctic Council, but also in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Seems to me, just from your comments today, but also this morning, uh, that the blue ocean economy and the, and the economies coming from the oceans, similar to what Iceland has done with energy, is export mm -hmm. that intellectual capacity and mm -hmm. show other countries frameworks for mm -hmm. ways in which they can also adopt these these regimes. Yeah, well, it was not, uh, and that's another story. It was not like that. We're we interested in other stories. Yeah, right? yeah. It was not like that Iceland has thought, you know, we really, we, we foresee, you know, 100 years before everyone else, the climate change, and we wanted to uh, save the save the environment. It was not the case. We were just broke. We didn't have foreign currency. <laughs> and then we had all this hot water everywhere, and uh, we used it both for heating up the houses and also for making electricity. Mm. And now probably the best, single best thing that we could do to fight climate change if we would use geothermal uh, water to heat up the houses, mm -hmm. if we can take one thing out. And this can be done in so many countries. I, uh, and we are trying to uh, share that knowledge uh, everywhere we can. As I understand it, the problem is that it takes a little time for the investor to get the money yeah. back. So they are more interested in, in uh, other, uh, other ways of making a renewable energy, which I think is, 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 is not good because this mm -hmm. is, and it surprised me, you don't need as extremely hot water as it is in Iceland. You have uh, quite a lot of, uh, you could do it a lot here in, in, uh, in America. It's been done in China. The far largest system is in China, uh, based on work with the Icelanders and, and uh, Chinese companies. We have it in Africa, Europe, everywhere. So this is another example of uh, that, uh, something that we have done, which we can use in other parts of the world. Okay, thank you. Now, I will turn it over to, <laughs> I have first question here and then one to my left. Marisol, thank you. Oh, you need this, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alexei Bogdanovsky. I'm a reporter with uh, RIA Novosti, Russian news agency. Um, Secretary Pompeo accused uh, Russia of illegal demands in the nor northern sea route, uh, namely uh, that uh, Russia asks for permissions to pass. And he also decried what he called attempts by China to develop infrastructure and in some case security presence in the Arctic. Um, he also accused both Russia and China of attempts to militarize the Arctic. Uh, even so, the United States have some plans to broaden their military presence in the region and maybe to conduct uh, freedom of navigation operations. Does Iceland have similar differences with Russia and China on those two issues? Thank you. Well, to cut a long story short, uh, our main priority, and I think it's extremely important than the Arctic as the rest of the world that we is, is an international uh, area and we should uh, use international law uh, and that's the most important thing. Now we are chairing the uh, uh, Arctic Council and just to be honest we are not going to be uh, judging if we, if we uh, can uh, avoid that. It's our, our task is that uh, to help to see that this vision that we uh, do have and uh, uh, all the uh, other Arctic Council nations, and I hope all the observers have, is that we will see uh, the Arctic as a non-militarized uh, area, low tension, peaceful, uh, and there we will have, uh, and it's ruled by international law, and uh, that's the big challenge. And uh, so uh, that is the short, uh, short answer. And that is our main task. Thank you. Here to my left and then over to my right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question, thank you, thanks, Fraga. My question in a sense follows from, from yours about sharing uh, with other countries frameworks from the Arctic. Mm. And one such framework, the principal one is this, you know, the Arctic Council, which is a wonderful example of countries, you know, working by consensus with the active input from the uh, from the PPOs, the indigenous, and I saw this firsthand mm -hmm. myself when I worked Arctic Council issues in Canada. So for the rest of the world, below the top of the world, mm -hmm. what uh, uh, 
perhaps you could say a few words on a thought being given to you know to just to popularize this model and kind of expand it, uh, expand it and apply it to other parts of the world thank you well i think that uh, uh, i agree with you i think it's extremely important and i think that i mean the world is as it is it's not maybe that like, like we would want it to be so uh, for example in a, in a, in a body like that, a forum that is very important to have consensus. And what I find also extremely good because of the importance that even though there is a lot of tensions and uh, things going on uh, which affects the Arctic Council members in other parts of the world, so far and long may it continue, that doesn't affect the work of the Arctic Council. And I, uh, because sometimes I get the question, is it effective enough? Maybe not, but uh, think about it if we wouldn't have the Arctic Council. I think it would be, uh, that would be really difficult. And one is that the meetings of the ministers and uh, the, uh, the ones who are in, in uh, uh, could say charge in the Arctic Council, but uh, all the subsidiary uh, bodies that are working are so important. And get a consensus of uh, agreements, for example, with search and rescue, uh, scientific research and other things are extremely important. And th those works are done not in one location, it's done all over. And I think it's so important, for example, just to connect all these people who are in the Arctic, these four million people. Of course, we cannot connect all of them, but it would be on great advantage, for example, if just all the scientific work that's been done could be translated into all the uh, uh, languages. Mm. So every uh, individual or scientific in every country could uh, use it for their benefits. That is uh, uh, maybe a, a small thing, but I think it would be have a big influence. And I agree with you, when you meet, uh, are at the meetings, then you see people who are definitely not neighbors, but they are all in the Arctic. And uh, they uh, share the same vision and uh, they, share a lot of experience which uh, everyone can use. Let me just follow up just for a moment, then to my right and then Joel back to my left, but let me just follow up on that one for a moment because over the last few years, people have been using the phrase Arctic exceptionalism, right? Mm -hmm. No matter what happens outside mm -hmm. of the Arctic, it doesn't, it doesn't bust the Arctic bubble, mm -hmm. that, that it has been uh, immune, mm -hmm. at least publicly from, the Arctic has been immune publicly from other things. Mm -hmm. They specifically talk about Syria, Ukraine, Crimea, other things. Mm -hmm. uh, but with uh, recent events, especially over the last month, mm -hmm. there seems to be some pressure on that, on that bubble now. And it will be, I would expect, a challenge to keep that preserved through your chairmanship, knowing that there will be stresses, not just from outside, but maybe within the Arctic Council as well, as it tries to deal with the evolving Arctic, it too must evolve. What you're actually saying is this is probably the worst time for anyone to take over the chairmanship <laughs> of the Arctic Council. I was trying to be <laughs> diplomatic, <laughs> but apparently you saw I right it was through my that. Job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we switched roles for a moment. No, yeah, well, it is. But of course, it's not been without uh, tension. It's not like that people come, you know, where, uh, but so far, and as I said, said long may it continue, we have uh, left this out at the table and in our work. And it's very important to do so. But I think that, uh, seriously, it's a very challenging times, mm. both at the Arctic Council and, and other parts of the world. Uh, but we will do our utmost. It's a priority in our foreign uh, uh, policy, we have been uh, putting a lot of emphasis in the, uh, uh, on the preparation and uh, we will do everything we can to uh, keep it as it is uh, and uh, move forward. Okay. Thank you. To my right here and then Joel to the left. Dave. Thank you. Tak fear. thank you so much. Um, uh, Minister Thordson and, and Dr. Schwager, thank you for remarkable um, remarks. Uh, my name is Anita Parlow. I was uh, with the Ar Har Harvard MIT Arctic Fisheries Project, a brief stint with Wilson and a Fulbright in Iceland. And I was in the National Energy Authority at Orkestofnen. And I was just back from China and um, I I remarkable uh, meetings indeed. And both from your comments and uh, from uh, uh, Secretary Pompeo's comments, uh, a, a brief question. Um, 
One is to the extent that there was no, for the first time ever, ministerial, as we all know, um, expression uh, document reached as a result of the reluctance to utilize the term climate change. Um, and given that climate change and policies that you spoke about were, were quite significant to the approach that you all be taking um, in, in this important period of time, um, how are you going to deal with that both as a matter of financing, as a matter of moving forward, and as a matter of building the kind of remarkable consensus that is a reflection of the Arctic Council? And the second part, which was a follow-up really of, of what Mike had asked, uh, in terms of the energy policy, the, the polar belt and road, if you will, it's, it's astounding and breathtaking, mm -hmm. and to the extent it may not be as much as its hype, uh, the financing of Sabetta Port, for example, and the oil and gas uh, development, the LNG, uh, et cetera, which will be feeding China's um, uh, growing need for energy. How does that factor in or does that factor in? And final point, in the discussions there of Iceland's um, geothermal project, there are 70 apparently pro projects and counting uh, in China about geothermal development. And at the meeting, Senator Murkowski said that maybe the US and Washington should talk about that too. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I'm just wondering how you put those pieces together. Thank, Thank you, you very much. You, you could take one, all three. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, these were um, good questions. Uh, first of all, uh, even though we didn't have, uh, we could say, traditional uh, statements as we usually have, we definitely have the mandate to go forward in the next two years, and that's important. And I think that that is good. Uh, you need, we needed to get uh, get consensus, and uh, that was what was done. And uh, so we are not we are not uh, worried about that. I think that uh, one of the uh, biggest tasks in the near future is when it comes to national resources, how we gonna, how they gonna be exploited in the in the Arctic. Here we have a gentleman who have uh, did a fantastic job to put together agreement for the first time in, in history that uh, we we haven't caught one fish in the seas, but we have this framework how that should be done. And I see it as a uh, good example of what we should do in, uh, when it comes to other natural resources. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, quite a task. Um, when it comes to uh, uh, the Belt and, and Road and, uh, initiative, uh, then, uh, of course, I think the, uh, in general it's good to build an infrastructure and, and build a connection between uh, countries and, and continents. It has been criticized, as, as we know, and that's something that uh, everyone looks into. Uh, uh, we, we have not uh, signed up to uh, the Belt and Road in Initiative, but we have cooperation in, in many fields. You mentioned one, which is uh, on geothermal. It's a very productive not for both parties, and uh, it's quite an uh, it's experience to uh, witness for example, the difference if you have, uh, for example, the cities involved which had uh, really uh, lot polluted because of, of coals, uh, then they have now geothermal uh, uh, system which works perfectly, uh, very uh, reliable and, uh, and you do not have any, any pollution. So uh, there were so many questions, I probably are forgetting That's some of them. <laughs> <laughs> we may come back if we have time. Joel, please. Thanks, Joel Clement from the Harvard Arctic Initiative. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming today, Minister. We look forward to working with you throughout the term of the chairmanship and, and thereafter. So thanks for coming. You mentioned a couple of different priorities. W one we've talked about uh, quite a lot is attracting investment to the Arctic. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and that's very important. You also talked about the global climate crisis and how it's particularly pronounced in the Arctic region. So I wonder if I could get your thoughts on a couple of potential criteria for Arctic investments. The first being that any investment in the Arctic should consider the impacts of climate change and be resilient to those impacts. Mm -hmm. And the second, uh, should oil and gas infrastructure actually be any kind of a priority given uh, the, cl the global climate crisis? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I think that uh, it's very important that when we are doing investment and the economic activity that we are trying to do it in a sustainable way. And that's the reason we have the main theme is always sustainable. I mean, Iceland is a good example of if we were not sustainable, we wouldn't, uh, 
it, it was not, we wouldn't have the life standards we do have. We really need to be sustainable when it comes to fisheries, when it comes to our energy. And actually tourism too, which is the newest boom. Because if we, uh, if we are not going to do that, then uh, our future generation, and not, not in the long future, just our kids will, will, will suffer. So uh, that's, the, uh, that's the main idea. When it comes to the oil and gas, well, then uh, our friends in Norway say that they can and have done it in a very, well, uh, on high standard. Uh, and I am not sure that we, uh, I don't know if it's uh, realistic that we are not going to stop using oil or gas in, in the near future, even though we are, have high ambitions in Iceland when it comes to, to uh, getting out, getting rid of fossil, fossil fuel. And if we're going to do it, then we're going to do it on the higher standard. I think that's extremely, extremely important. But this is uh, one of the uh, challenges we see, and also when it comes to mining and uh, other, other similar things. Uh, and uh, hopefully we will see uh, changes, <coughs> but we need a lot of changes in a very short period of time that we will not have the same need for oil and gas. But if we're going to uh, exploit oil and gas, then we should do it at the highest environmental standard. Thank you. At one in the back and then here to my left, John, after Dave, please. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Mr. Minister, let me add my thanks as well to you for coming here and more importantly for your leadership in this important moment in the Arctic. Um, I want to ask you a question about something you and I were discussing this morning. Uh, yes, the Icelandic chairmanship of the Arctic Council has just begun but I can tell you from personal experience that two years can pass by pretty quickly. After you comes Russia, and I'm wondering what your vision is for working with Foreign Minister Lavrov and others in the Russian government to prepare mm. for that transition, which after all is not so far away. Mm. Well, I think it's extremely important that there will be a smooth transition. Uh, I, think, I don't think it's, well, we took over from the Finns and it was very successful uh, cooperation. And uh, I sometimes get asked the question, what are you going to do, like we're going to change everything in these two years? No, <laughs> continuity is very extremely important. The things that we've been building up for a long time, it needs to be continued. So we were not going to do any drastic changes or the good things that have been done before us, both from the Finn side and others. And uh, it's a priority for us to have the same smooth transition between Iceland and Russia and also with Finland and, and Iceland. And I, am, uh, I met uh, with uh, Sergei Lavrov in, in Ruoniemi uh, a few weeks ago and uh, we decided that I will visit him in, in Moscow. Okay. And uh, the main reason is, of course, that uh, the work on the Arctic Council, though it will, of course, will be other, other issues also. But having these eight countries, of course, it's no news that the Nordic countries work smoothly together, but how the Nordic countries, US, Canada, and Russia working uh, as, uh, as constructive as we have done so far is, of, is highly important, and we will do everything we can uh, so it will continue. Okay, thank you. Now there's a question in the back and then up here in the front with John. Uh, thank you. Uh, ben Kessling with the Wall Street Journal. Uh, question about multilateralism and bilateralism. So the Arctic Council is, is one, of, one of those multilateral institutions uh, are, uh, around. As the U.S. and China move towards more bilateral relationships across the globe, what does that do to chip away at sort of the very foundations of something like the Arctic Council, which depends on mutual agreement and countries working with each other rather than countries working with just one other country coming up with, uh, coming up with the hodgepodge agreements? Second uh, question I've got for you is, what, um, what can we learn from, from what's happened at the other end of the globe, at, in Antarctica? Are there any uh, standards uh, that, we can, that we can look to uh, for governance, for, for tradition, for claims to territory, et cetera, that's happening uh, at the other end uh, of the polar, polar world? And do you see that possibly influencing things in the Arctic? Thank you. Well, thank you. you uh, these are important questions. First, when you go to multilateralism or bilateralism, uh, we will always need to have both. Of course, I am extremely in favor and, and Icelanders when it comes to multilateralism. But of course, we, multilateralism isn't enough. 
it has to work. And you mentioned, uh, for example, that China and, and the US are discussing trade. Uh, of course, I would have liked to see that done on WTO level. But uh, we have to admit that there hasn't been uh, much going on in WTO for a very long time. And that's the problem. And uh, I think that traditionally it, it would be uh, fair to say that both when it comes to WTO and GATT, the ones who have been the, on the driver's seat, who has been the progressive, was the US. But the others didn't follow as they should. Uh, and uh, so now we have the situa uh, situation, which I hope will be dealt with successfully. And then I mean in that way that we will see uh, more and stronger or more efficient WTO, which is extremely, extremely important. Uh, but we will always have bilateral agreement and, and, and cooperation. And uh, even though uh, I hope that, I sincerely hope, and that's the benefit for the benefit of everyone, that we will not see uh, tra more trade wars in, in, the, uh, in the near and distant future, but we, when we have destruction to trade, then there will be only be losers. There are no winners if there are destruction to trade. And free trade, uh, and international trade is much more than only uh, uh, giving money for service and goods, much more. It's connecting people, people understand each other, uh, different culture and so on. And it's a very important way to, to make peace. But this doesn't, I cannot see this uh, affect uh, the Arctic Council, not directly. But the short answer is that uh, multilateralism is extremely important, but we also need to be critical. If something isn't working, then we need to fix it. That's, of course, Im very important. But, uh, uh, and, uh, but we are not going to deal or solve these issues, if it's climate change or trade or whatever, without uh, multilateral uh, institutions. That's one thing for sure. Uh, to be honest, uh, Antarctica is quite a long way from Iceland, and I am no expert in it, and uh, I have <laughs> two ways I can say something that makes uh, you know, sounds okay, but or just tell the truth, I am no expert, and I don't know if we can use some of the things they're using there. But there are, there are individuals in the audience here who might be able to help you when we're, when <laughs> we're done. Yeah. There, there is some expertise in the room. I think we have time for one more question, John, and then uh, uh, I know we'll try to get to some things afterwards, but. Uh, depending on the minister's schedule. John? Thank you, Minister. I have a question about one of the goals of your chair of your Arctic Council chairmanship, and that was strengthening the Arctic Council. Mm -hmm. And you gave examples. One was it sounded like increased communication internally and, and additional effort externally, such as with the Arctic Economic Council. Mm -hmm. Is one of the objectives of strengthening the Arctic Council to return to the possibility of creating a strategic plan? Uh, that had been attempted in the last chairmanship and perhaps even prior to that. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering whether Iceland has some interest in trying to revive that concept. Of course, that would be an uh, extremely important and good thing to do. What we are really f trying to do now is find w which possibilities is there to strengthen it. I don't think it's, imp I, I think it's very important that we are just realistic in this situation which we are in now. Uh, what I find extremely successful is that we have binding uh, treaties, for example, when it comes to search and rescue and uh, emergency preparedness and response and, and cooperation in Arctic science. Uh, I, have, I have the dream that we have more of those. I think that's very important. And of course we need, and uh, the work which is done in these, all these groups, they shouldn't be underestimated. Of course, it's not like it's not on the news every day, but uh, I think it would be really, it would be a big step backwards if that if we wouldn't have that. Uh, how far we can go, uh, both the uh, forum, the Arctic Council, and also making other treaties or strategic plans, we have to have to see. Uh, but we will do our utmost to make it make it happen. Thank you, John. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, an hour goes by very quickly. 
Minister, I want to thank you very much for this wide-ranging discussion we've had, mm -hmm. for your time here today, and I would like to ask that when you're next in town, mm -hmm. you come back and visit us again, because as you can see, quite, quite engaged and quite interested in, in the day. I want to thank you all for, for coming here today. There will be follow-up with our Harvard friends, both here and at, at Harvard, related to the uh, Arctic Council's agenda under the Icelandic leadership. I want to thank the Icelandic leadership for allowing us to be a part of this event. You will note outside there's lots of traffic. The Wilson Center today is very full with programs. So when you leave, you'll have to navigate a number of crowds. I'm sorry for that, but that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, and again, Minister, thank you so very much. Please thank Minister. Thank you. Thank you so much.